good message in that that song as well. God is strong, as we'll look at briefly today. Would like to uh, welcome Pastor Tim's brothers, Luke and Jake. They're here visiting with us for I think it's three weeks, guys. Is that about right? Yep. And so you'll want to meet them after the service. Now, since January, once a month, it hasn't always worked, um, but once a month I've tried to bring a message, a sermon, on some aspect of God. You know, if you're saved, you're going to spend eternity with God, so it's, it's good. It only makes sense that we get to know as much about God as possible. And so I've tried to bring a different message on different aspects of God. We've looked at the love of God. We've looked at his power and strength. We've looked at his wisdom and and some other attributes. And today we're going to um, we're going to look at the Trinity. How about that? Yeah. Now this is an important aspect of God, and it's one that I encourage you to take a couple of notes. Because uh, you'll probably run into someone somewhere that has questions about the Trinity. Or they may say to you, well, you Christians, you believe in three gods, don't you? And you'll want to know how you can uh, properly answer them. And so today's subject about God is the Trinity. Let's begin with a moment of prayer. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes. Our Heavenly Father, we come once again in the name of Jesus and for your glory and for your sake, Lord. We want to preach the word and we ask that your Holy Spirit would be the real Bible teacher today. Please help us to be able to deal with this subject of of your person, uh, the Trinity. Lord, help us. We, we're so poor and weak in, in mind and thought and reason and process. Help us, Lord, to grasp something today that will help us. I pray, Lord, that if there be someone that may have questions about the Trinity, that perhaps this message would help answer those questions. Lord, I pray that also if there be those who have not yet been truly born again, um, Father, that today it would please you to open the eyes of their understanding. And it just seems, Lord, that until you open their eyes, they remain shut and blind to the truth. And Lord, we long with all our heart for the whole world to come to a knowledge of the truth. Lord, help us to take a step in your direction today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Now, if you were to ask a lot of people how many sides a coin has, chances are they would answer you and they'd say, well, two, right? Every coin has two sides. That's often what they say. And uh, we have a photo of a fictitious coin. You put that up for us? There we go. There's our little fictitious coin. And uh, sure enough, uh, from the way it's situated, you can see one of the sides. You can see the what we'd say the top side. And we just put a little dollar sign there just to kind of give you an idea. It didn't have to be a, a coin of monetary value, but just for the sake of the illustration. So... You ask someone, how many sides does a coin have? And uh, most people would probably tell you the coin has two sides. And yet we want to ask, what about this right here? And a lot of people would say, well, that's the edge. Uh, If you were to ask them, is the edge a side? Uh, They might think about that. And uh, a good percentage would probably say, no, it's not a side. Uh, It's an edge. The top and the bottom, those are sides. But that other thing, that's just an edge. Well, what if we were to make the edge a little thicker, a little fatter? You have that next uh, slide for us? So there we thickened it up a bit. This is not a stack. This is one coin. Imagine carrying a pocket full of those. hmm? One coin. Look at the size of that edge. Would we call that an edge? Now, now we'd call it a side, wouldn't we? Yeah, now how many sides does the coin have? Three, yeah. It's got a top and a bottom and a, we don't know what to call it, a big fat edge. It's a side though, whatever it is. And uh, so we determine here that the coin 
uh, coins today, you can put that away, thanks. Coins today, they, they definitely have two sides. But I suggest to you that they have a third side, even though it's thin. It's still a side. And listen to this. Um, my point is, it takes all three sides to make a single coin. How about that? It takes all three sides to make even a thin side, very skinny side, but it takes all three sides to make a coin. You cannot have a coin with only two sides. Why? Because a coin is a three-dimensional object. Does that make sense? Yeah. So we conclude that a coin is one. It's a single coin, one unit, and yet it has three separate sides. Are you following me? Because I'm going to say the same thing is true about God. God is one. He is one God, one holy God, and yet He exists in three distinct persons. God the Father, Say it with me if you know. God the Son and God the Holy Ghost. Right. Now we call this the Trinity. The Trinity. And uh, because we believe in the Trinity, that God, this one God, is made up of three separate persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Holy Ghost, we would call ourselves Trinitarian because we believe in the Trinity. People who do not believe in the Trinity are known as non-Trinitarian. Does that make sense? So far so good? How many here know of someone who does not believe in the Trinity? They're non-Trinitarian. Do you know of anyone? I see two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, or about a dozen hands, something like that. So they do exist. See, there's proof right there. The mouth of two or three witnesses. There are many people today who deny the Trinity and they call themselves non-Trinitarian. Some of them believe that God is only Father and Son, uh, but most would believe that God is only Father. Now, non-Trinitarian groups today would include Mormons, Jehovah's Witnesses, Christadelphians, Christian scientists, they're neither Christian nor scientific, Assemblies of Yahweh, the Way International, Iglesia Ni Cristo. How many know that one? Iglesia Ni Cristo. They got a great big building. Those are the flying churches, right? They believe that uh, the whole church physical, the building is going to go up into heaven. And so that's why they're telling their people, get into church. <laughs> that's scare tactics. <laughs> but they're out there. Uh, there's a, a group of Pentecostals that call themselves Oneness Pentecostals. Oneness Pentecostal. The reason they say oneness is because they don't believe in a trinity. They believe in God the Father only. And there's other groups as well. But denial of the trinity is nothing new. Some people were denying the trinity within the first couple hundred years of the church's existence. And so in 325 AD, a council was called and held in a Greek city called Nicaea. So it's the Nicene Council. Now, Nicaea is in modern Turkey today. And uh, they were called together to determine what is biblical truth. What does the Bible say on a number of issues? But one of the primary issues they wanted to deal with was the Trinity. In particular, Jesus Christ. Christ's deity was being brought into question. And so they got together and they searched the scriptures and they discussed between themselves and they came to a conclusion that the Bible clearly teaches the deity of Jesus Christ. That Jesus Christ is as much God as the Father is God. In fact, the Jesus of the New Testament is the Jehovah of the Old Testament. We're talking God. And then some 25 years later in AD 6360, they got together again, only this time in the city of Constantinople. It's not called that anymore. And they discussed the Holy Spirit and whether or not the Holy Spirit was divine. And at the end of their, their council, which lasted several days, they, they decided and declared that, yes, indeed, the Bible does clearly teach that the Holy Spirit is God, as much God as the Father is God, as much God as Jesus is God. And so we had these, these two councils of uh, Christian pastors and theologians that got together many, many years ago to determine this. 
You say, well, if that's so, then why are there still people today who deny the Trinity? Why are there people, maybe you've got a friend at work or someone at school or a neighbor that you know that belongs to a group or something and they don't believe in the Trinity. Why are there people like that today? Well, the primary reason usually is because these people are not even saved. I'm just going to come right out, you know, and and tell you. Uh, The ones that I named, the groups I named, the Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses and so on, they do not teach a pure gospel of salvation by grace through faith. Rather, they teach a works-based type of salvation. You do enough of their good works and then you'll get up to heaven, something like that. And of course, that's not biblical. And so this is the first and foremost reason. However, it's true that even a born-again Christian man or woman can struggle with the thoughts of the Trinity. It was Martin Luther who uh, at one point he sat down and he thought he was going to figure out the Trinity. And he sat and he sat for the longest time and he was like still motionless and he was reading scripture and he was meditating. And I mean, hours went by. Maybe uh, as much as a day or two, I'm not sure, but a long period of time. And finally, he rose to his feet and said, the Trinity, who can possibly understand it? And he walked away. (laughs) Just write it down. There are going to be things that you won't understand in life. There will be things that you won't understand, but they don't have to hold you back. Um, I do know that it can happen that a uh, a well-intentioned Christian man or woman can become confused and wonder about the Trinity and start to ask questions and doubt in in his or her mind if the Trinity is biblical or not. Now, normally the reason this happens, and again, I'm just being very frank with you, the reason that would happen is because that Christian is not walking as close to the Lord as as they ought to. They've not been spending time with God daily. They've not been um, keeping up, you know, with Christian growth. They've been backsliding, and they've not been walking close to God. And they've probably been influenced by some of this non-Trinitarian religious writings and books by some of those groups. They've probably found something off the internet by some unsaved non-Trinitarian group or by some writer got a book or something and started reading it. And because they weren't walking as close to the Lord as they should, it's caused big question marks in their mind. And so they struggled with that. And so those are the, the two that I know of, the two reasons I know of. But something we need to be very upfront with, and that is there is no Bible verse that says God is a trinity. It does not exist. Uh, those words, in fact, the word trinity is not found in the Bible. You'll read it from Genesis to Revelation, and I hope you do. But you will not find the word trinity. Uh, nor will you find the words three in one. They do not exist in that fashion in the Bible. Nor does the word triune. Uh, None of these words exist. Uh, But uh, just as there are Bible verses that teach that God is one, and we just read one here in Mark 12 and verse 29, the Lord your God is one Lord. Just as there are Bible verses that teach that God is one God, there are many Bible verses that teach the three distinct persons of the Godhead. There are many of them. We'll just look at a few of them this morning. But we conclude that God is three separate persons in one. He is not three gods. We do not serve and worship three separate gods. We serve and worship one God. One God. And yet He is eternally existent in three persons. Uh, He is a three in one God. He is a triune Godhead. He is a trinity. All three separate persons come together and form one single God. And it's something like how a coin cannot exist unless it has three separate sides. Three separate sides make up a coin. Now, we have another picture. It's a very popular one. Put that up. Many people um, illustrate the Godhead this way. And they show God in, in the center and then off to one side. They'll show the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But notice, the Father is not the Son. That's very true. There are two separate, distinct persons. The Son is not the Holy Spirit. 
They're two separate persons. And the Holy Spirit is not the Father. They're two separate persons. No one seems to have a problem with the Father being God. Now that seems fairly universal. Uh, but it's when we talk about the Son and the Holy Spirit. Uh, it's a good illustration. It's a good illustration. I personally prefer the idea of the coin. You know, because you've got three sides... And all three are required to make up a coin. It just seems to me a little bit uh, easier. Now, I think we'd all agree, wouldn't we, that God is a complex being? Would you agree with that? That God is maybe more complex than you or I? Right now, we uh, are very much uh, bound in by three dimensions and a beginning and an end. That's our lives here on the planet, right? But God is so much beyond He's so much greater and above. He's more complex than we are. He has existed for all eternity. That fact alone, our minds cannot fully comprehend that. That is beyond our ability. We can think, you know, in definite terms. Okay, a million, all right, add another million, add a billion. But what comes after that? Well, you just keep going. What does that mean? You just keep going and going and going. I can't get my head around that. We humans have a trouble. Now, we can explain it mathematically, but um, we might call that rationally. But experientially, we, we, can't, we can't get our mind around it. A man who's never tasted peanut butter, you try to explain it to him, and, you know, he might understand, you know, the f mathematical or the chemical formulas of peanut and oil and... They like to throw sugar in there too, I think. And so that's, that's the peanut butter. But he'll not understand it experientially until he experiences it. We will not experience eternity until we experience it. Until then, it's just a fact in our head. That's all. We cannot properly comprehend eternity. Now, um, it's no great surprise to learn that God exists in a totally superior way of living than what we humans do. Now, philosophers, for those of us today who like a little philosophy, philosophers say that if you, if you take a single dimension of life and then add to that another new dimension of life, totally different, and then add to that once again another totally separate, totally new dimension of life, then uh, what you end up with is um, uh, an exponential increase in the possibilities. For example, they say if you take one dimension, you get a straight line. If you take two dimensions, you'll get a drawing. If you take three dimensions, you'll get an object. And so it's the same when you add the dimensions, you get greater possibilities. Now, we humans, we live in a single dimensional world with fixed limitations, the beginning, the ending, I've mentioned this. But when we get saved, we add, or there's added to us, a whole new, totally new and different dimension called eternal life. That is now added to us eternal life with God, and this alone changes the possibilities of our lives. It changes it beyond what we can understand, beyond our expression. We just can't fully understand right now. Even the greatest theologians don't fully understand all of the ramifications of getting saved and eternal life. Um, the Bible backs this up. It says in 1 Corinthians 2.9, But as it is written, I hath not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. Ephesians 3.20 says, Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we can ask or think. Now that's just us. You know, this human element here. But when it comes to God Himself, God is so much greater uh, in every possible way uh, that what we have to do in order to get some handle on who God is, is we ascribe to Him three qualities. The first quality is omniscience. Omniscience means God knows everything that exists and God knows everything that does not yet exist. 
He knows everything, 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 everything. In Isaiah 55, God says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. If someone is going to be God, they have to possess omniscience. We have some crazies on earth who parade about and refer to themselves as God. I know that sounds strange and blasphemous, but it's true. There are people on earth who are claiming to be God Almighty. And if that's the truth, then they possess omniscience, which they do not. Only deity, only God himself possesses omniscience. Number two is omnipresence. This is the second quality that would define God or deity. Because remember, God is so much greater than what we are. Omnipresence means that God is everywhere, all at the same time. Us humans, we sometimes even struggle to be in one place at one time. Right? Many of you said, I'm going to church. I'm going to be there for 11 o'clock. Didn't happen. Or I'm going to church. I'm going to be there at 10 o'clock. Didn't happen. We struggle to be in one place at one time. Often we say, boy, I wish I could be in two places at the same time. Sometimes we say that, I wish I could be two people. Problem is, if you were, you'd get into a fight with yourself. Because you'd both think of the, what, this is the way we're going to do it. No way. This is the way over here. No way. And then you get into an argument or something. Well, God is able to be everywhere all at the same time. Everywhere. Only God can do that. Not even Satan can do that. That means that if Satan is at my front door harassing me, you can breathe easy because he's not at yours. He can only be in one place at one time. The third quality is omnipotence. Omnipotence means all power. And God currently holds the record. God has all power, listen to this, all power that has ever existed and all power that ever will exist. God has it all. They say that you cannot change, you cannot eliminate energy, you can only change its force. The uh, uh, physics people uh, tell us that, those great scientists. But uh, God knows, God has all power. Every scrap, every bit of power belongs to Him. Now, let's take a little uh, tour through the Bible, and let's examine some verses that teach the deity of Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. Let's begin with the deity of Jesus Christ. Take your Bible and turn to the Gospel of John in chapter 1. This would be a great place for us to begin. John chapter 1. This is a familiar verse, the first one we're going to look at. I have, I think, four in total. Um, folks, uh, I'm only giving you just the, uh, the condensed version of this, all right? There are literally volumes, books written on these subjects. And we do not have the time or space, you know, to look at every word on every page and every scripture from Genesis to Revelation. So I'm just giving you a few. But I hope these few are enough for you. John chapter 1, verse 1. I'd like to ask your your cooperation and read it out loud with me as we read together. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now, if you're wondering who the Word was, just take a look there at verse 14. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Now, I know that there are uh, religious cults, we call them Christian cults, that deny the deity of Jesus Christ, and they vehemently deny that verse. That verse is so powerful that what the cults had to do was change it. They had to change that verse to try and say that Jesus is not the God, He is only a God. And uh, if you were to uh, talk to them, they'd be very animated about this. Oh no, your Bible's wrong because uh, the absence of the definite article in the Greek language means he's only a God. And they would say, in the beginning he was with God and the word was a God. That's, they say, what it means. Well, I'll have you know that in verse 6 you have exactly the same 
Greek construction, there is no definite article. When we say definite article, we're talking about the, T-H-E. That's a definite article. The pulpit, the door, the God. And they're saying because there is no the, it's automatically assumed as a a pulpit, a door, a God. And so there's no definite article in verse 1 in the Greek language. Look at verse 6. There's no definite article there. So, according to their way of thinking, it should read, there was a man sent from a God, whose name was John. Now that sounds stupid, doesn't it? A God. A man sent from a God. And then we work our way down, verse 12. But as many as received him, to them gave you power to become the sons of a God. Verse 13, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of a God. Well, that sounds stupid. But using their own stupidity, you have to be consistent now. That's exactly what you'd come up with because there's no definite article in those verses either. The truth is this, the greatest linguists, minds in the world that deal with the Greek language will tell you that that is the correct translation. What you have the Word was God. That is a knockout blow right there. Let's go to chapter 8. Chapter 8. Here we have the Lord Jesus, and He is uh, confronting some of the Jewish religious intelligentsia. And we'll start here at verse uh, 56. And Jesus says, Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. Now there's Abraham some 2,000 years before Jesus was on earth. And uh, of course the, the Jews, verse 57, they scoffed, they laughed at him. They said, Thou art not yet 50 years old, and hast thou seen Abraham? And yet that verse, that, the truth of that verse 56 shows that Christ transcends time. And if you look at verse 58, Jesus answered them, and Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, before Abraham was, I am. Now how many have ever read the book of Exodus? Raise your hand if you've read the book of Exodus. I hope every hand could go up. Uh, God, Jehovah God, revealed Himself to Moses. When Moses said, well, who should I say you are? When they asked me, what's the name of God? And then God replied to Abraham, tell them, I am hath sent you. God revealed Himself as the great I am. And here the Lord Jesus in verse 58 said, Before Abraham was, before he ever existed, before the conception was ever made in his mummy's womb, before it ever happened, I am. That is a knockout blow. That is a powerful proof that Jesus is God of very God. Jesus was saying, I am. Jehovah of the Old Testament said to Moses, I am. He said, well, uh, that's, just, uh, that's just your interpretation. Oh, really? I'll have you know the unsaved Jews understood what Jesus was saying. Because look what happened in verse 59. Then took they up stones to cast at him. See that? They didn't cast stones at him for healing the sick and raising the dead and opening the eyes of the blind. That's not why they cast stones at him. They cast stones at him because he made himself to be God. That's why, he made, that's why they picked up stones. So those verses are knockout blows. And now if you turn to chapter 20. This is after the resurrection. We have Jesus revealing himself to the disciples. Verse 24, Thomas, one of the twelve, called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. Uh-oh, he should have been in church. Wasn't there when Jesus showed up. So now, next week, verse um, 26, after eight days again, the disciples were within. There's Thomas with them. Go down to verse 27. Jesus said to Thomas, saith to Thomas, reach hither thy finger and behold my hands. Reach hither thy hand and thrust it, uh, uh, thrust it into my side and be not faithless but believing. Verse 28, read it out loud. And Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and my God. 
Now, it would have been the height of blasphemy for Jesus to receive that if he was not God. He should have said, whoa, time out, Thomas. Don't worship me. Worship the Father. I'm not God. But yet Jesus received that. Why? Because Jesus is God. That's why. And so it was absolutely proper for Thomas to say what he said. And it was absolutely proper for Jesus to receive what Thomas had said. Now, those are just a couple of scriptures. We could look at numerous others. And that would make an excellent study for anyone to look at other verses. There's one that comes to mind in Colossians. And it, it, uh, it, it talks about um, all of the fullness of the Godhead rests in Jesus Christ. You know, it says all of the fullness of the Godhead in Him bodily. And what um, the Jehovah's Witness Bible does is they change that verse. They changed it to say all the qualities but it doesn't say all the qualities. It says all the fullness, as full as full as God is, is found in Jesus Christ. All the fullness of the Godhead is in Jesus Christ. You see, we only worship one God. And He's eternally existed in three persons, the Father and the Son, and now we come to the Holy Spirit. Let's look at a few verses that deal with the deity of the Holy Spirit. The famous Christian cult, Jehovah's Witnesses, they deny the person of the Holy Spirit and they just simply say, He's a force. Just like you would blow, and you can feel that on your hand. Well, what comes out your mouth is, is, not, is not living. It's just a force. That's all it is. That's all the Holy Spirit is, they say. I say they're wrong. And not me only, but I mean millions and millions that have gone before me say they're wrong. At the Council of Constantinople, they debated this and debated it for days, and they said the Holy Spirit is a person. So let's begin with an Old Testament verse in the book of Psalms. If you go to Psalm 139, about the middle of the Bible, you'll find Psalms and 139. This is a marvelous psalm here. Psalm of David. You see how it, how it ends? He says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. And see if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. That's a good prayer for every born-again man, woman, and young person here today. Keep every day asking God to search you. But what I want you to see is in verse 7. And David writes, Whither shall I go from thy spirit? Or whither shall I flee from thy presence? Now notice that David is connecting the spirit with the presence of God. We have here what most theologians, conservative theologians, would understand to be a reference to the Holy Spirit. And that the Holy Spirit is the same as God, because as God is omnipresent, so is the Spirit. Look at it. Whither shall I go from thy spirit? Or whither shall I flee from thy presence? If I ascend up into heaven, behold, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost part, parts of the sea, even there shall thy hand lead me, and thy right hand shall hold me. You see, the spirit here and God's presence are equal. So whatever God's presence is, so is the Spirit. God's presence is part of Himself, His deity. Therefore, the Spirit is deity. Interesting verse, isn't it? Now let's go into the New Testament. And we'll go to the book of Acts. Acts chapter 5. This is a sad story here about a husband and wife. They should have probably come to one of, one of our marriage retreats that we hold every year as a church. But Ananias and Sapphira, they didn't come. Now that doesn't mean if you don't come that you're going to do what they did by no means. Only they did what they did. I'm just trying to... Uh... Never mind. 
All right, now we have here a certain man named Ananias and with Sapphira, his wife. They sold a possession. Why did they do that? You see in the previous verse, chapter 4, verse 37, here's Barnabas. He had a piece of land. It says, verse 37, having land, sold it and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. Now that money would have been used to meet needs in the early church then. By the way, there's nothing wrong with giving to the local church because the church knows how to use the money properly. Verse 1, chapter 5, But a certain man named Ananias with Sapphira his wife sold a possession and kept back part of the price, his wife also being privy to it, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. And that was as if to say, we sold the land and here's all the money we got for it, here it is here. And yet they kept back part of it in their pockets. They were... I don't know, greedy, they were selfish, they were sinful, call it what you will, but it was a big mistake on their part. Verse 3, But Peter said, Ananias, why hath Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost? To lie to the Holy Ghost. Now, can you lie to this pulpit? Can you... I, mean, I suppose you could. You could stand up against this pulpit and say, now I'm going to tell you something. It's the truth. But the moon is made of blue cheese. Ha ha, got you there. You could, you'd look silly doing it. But you could try to lie to this pulpit. But that's dumb. You could try and lie to the wall, to the door, to the rug. But what's the meaning of that? You don't lie to inanimate objects. You lie to people. People of intelligence. Those are the ones you lie to. Sometimes salespeople, praise the Lord, not all of them, but sometimes salespeople can get very unscrupulous. Uh, back in 1977, can you picture this? I used to sell new and used cars. That's true. For one year, I used to work for a, a car dealership, and I used to sell new and used. And they, I was a Christian, though. And uh, there was a saying, they had a saying back then in 1977, 1978, and the saying was this, you don't have to lie to sell cars, but it sure helps. That was the saying, that's what they said back then. And I had a friend who uh, got in the, sell, the sale of uh, new and used cars about the same time as I did, and he sold four or five times as many as I did. And in, because I knew him, he was my buddy. And in talking with him, I discovered his secret. Guess what his secret was? He'd lie, he'd tell anything he had to. Anything they wanted to hear, he'd tell them. This car, does it do 100 mile an hour? Oh, of course, it does more than 100 mile an hour. Probably off a cliff. <laughs> but he'd tell them anything, and he'd get the sale. And I was a Christian, I wasn't about to do that. So I didn't sell very many. But at least the ones I sold, I was proud of. Well, you don't lie to inanimate things. You lie to people. And so here's Peter saying to Ananias, Why hath Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost and to keep back part of the price of the land? So right away, Peter admits that the Holy Ghost is a person. He's someone that you can lie to. You shouldn't. But Ananias and Sapphira did. Now verse 4, Peter explains, and he says, when it was yours, you could have done with it anything you wanted to, right? Why have you conceived this thing in your heart? He says, look at the end of verse 4. Thou hast not lied unto men, but unto who? God. Who did, who did in verse 3, who did Peter say he just lied to in verse 3? The Holy Spirit. In verse 4, who's Peter saying that he lied to? God. You see the connection? Verse 3 to verse 4. The Holy Spirit is God. Peter's the one who said it, not me. You'd think Peter would know what he's talking about. And I think he does. Apparently, the Holy Ghost is God. From verse 3 and verse 4. Now take a look at 1 Corinthians and chapter 2. We're almost finished here. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Now I'd like you to follow along as I read verse 11. For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the spirit of man which is in him? Pause for a minute. Now that would mean that any one of us uh, you know yourself, what you're thinking. You know yourself, how you'll respond, how you'll react. You know your ups and downs. You know your thoughts better than someone else. 
you don't know that other person as well as they know themselves. That's what Paul is saying. For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the spirit of man which is in him? Even so, the things of God knoweth no man but the spirit of God. Now, how many things does God know? Everything. And we, we have a fancy theological word for that. What do we call it? Starts with O. Omniscience. And if you have omniscience, it means you're not human. It means you're divine. You're God. You're deity. If you know everything, everything, everything there is to know. Now, according to verse 11, the Holy Spirit knows everything that God knows. So what does that make the Holy Spirit? You see? Equal. As much as God the Father is God, as much as Jesus uh, is God, so the Holy Spirit is also God. Now again, um, there are many more verses that we could look at, but will not. We, there's a lot of verses that show the omniscience and the omnipresence and the omnipotence of both Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. And if we took the time, we could see how both Jesus and the Holy Spirit were active with the Father in the creation of the world. All three were involved in the creating process. But the bottom line for you and for me today is this. The bottom line for every Christian is this. Take the Bible by faith. God said it, I believe it. That settles it. That's faith. I may not understand it, but God said it. A father calls his son over and says, Now, son, you're not going to understand what I'm going to ask you to do, but I want you to do it anyhow. Do I, ha do I have your agreement? Yes, Dad. You tell me what to do, I'll do it. Okay, the first thing I want you to do is uh, take this money and go down to the store and buy one of these and two of those and, and something else. The guy says, okay, I can do that. And he takes the money and he brings it all down. Now, okay, I want you to take one of number one and two of number two and I want you to mix them together. Why do you want me to do that? No, don't ask questions. Do you think you can obey? Yeah, I can do it. I, I'll do it. I don't understand it, but I'll do it. And some things you're going to understand. And some things you're not going to understand. But it doesn't hold you back from obedience to God. And that's what I'm saying that this matter of the Trinity is. God revealed who He is. He didn't have to, but He's revealed in the Scriptures that He is three in one. He is one God, eternally existing in three separate persons. There's been a lot of different illustrations for that. A man can be a son. He can be a husband. He can be a father. All at the same time. Isn't that right? Right. There's an old riddle that says, Brothers and sisters, have I none? But that man's father is my father's son. I'll repeat that for you. Brothers and sisters, have I none? But that man's father is my father's son. Okay? And we say, oh, yeah, come on now, that, that doesn't make sense. Brothers and sisters, have I none? But that man's father is my father's son. Well, he's talking about himself. Brothers and sisters, have I none? But that man's father is my father's son. The man he's talking about is himself. But that man's father is my father's son. Make sense? No? Doesn't matter. Take it home and tell it to your best friend and make him a bet or something like that. I don't know. But God is one God. We don't serve three gods. We serve one God. He is eternally existent in three separate persons. You have enough scripture to believe that. Take it by faith. Now that becomes very interesting when you think about it. The Trinity, the combined power of the Trinity is now there looking after you. Isn't that something? Like the added dimensions, one on top of the other, makes the possibilities unbelievably humongous. And you have that, my friend. You have that. 
You know, the Bible says this in Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 4 and in Romans chapter 1 verse 17 and Galatians chapter 3 verse 11 and Hebrews chapter 10 verse 38. All of those verses say the same thing. The just shall live by faith. The just shall live by faith. You read in the scriptures what God is. And this same God who loved you and died for you on the cross is bigger than anything you can possibly imagine. The God who paid for your salvation. The same God who died on the cross. The same God who rose from the grave. The same God who is in heaven watching over you now and praying for you. The same God is bigger than any problem you have. He is bigger than your worst nightmare. He is bigger than all of your enemies put together at the same time. God is bigger. He's bigger than all of your financial problems. He's bigger than all of your health problems. He's bigger than all of your social problems. He's bigger than all of your mental problems or emotional problems. God is bigger. You won't believe how big He is. But He is so bit much bigger. And He's there watching over you. Isn't that exciting to know? The combined power of the Trinity. Man, if that doesn't solve your problem, I don't know what will. A gospel singer by the name of Babby Mason. By the way, her father was a Baptist pastor. She wrote a number of well-known gospel songs, but one she wrote was entitled, Trust His Heart. And some of our people have sung this. All things work for our good, though sometimes we don't see how they could. Struggles that break our hearts in two sometimes blind us to the truth. Our Father knows what's best for us. His ways are not our own. So when your pathway grows dim and you just don't see Him, remember you're never alone. God is too wise to be mistaken. God is too good to be unkind. So when you don't understand, when you don't see His plan, when you can't trace His hand, trust His heart. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. Listen, why don't you come to God today on this invitation and lay yourself at the feet of the Holy Trinity? I want to invite you to come on this invitation. Maybe you've not come for a long time. Maybe it's actually been years. Why don't you come today and lay yourself at the feet of the Holy Trinity? Why don't you come and cast your cares upon Him for He careth for you? Or listen... Why don't you come and ask Him how you can serve Him better in your life? Serving Him better may involve following the Lord in the waters of baptism, joining the church, getting involved with missions and supporting missions, learning how to be a soul winner. We're starting classes at the end of September, Soul Winners University. Why don't you lay your life at His disposal and say, Lord, here am I. What can I do to serve you, Lord? Would you stand to your feet, please? And we'll have a moment of prayer. And I hope and pray that the message today on the Holy Trinity has found a place in your heart.